Well, today we have a returning guest, someone that uh, many of you are always keen to hear from because it's so hard to get any facts that are pretty brutally sticking to the objective reality of what's going on in the Ukraine war. And today, Colonel Douglas McGregor returns. How you doing, sir? Great. Thanks, David. Now, I wanted to bring you on because there's been some big developments uh, that we've heard in the news. We've heard of things like Bakhmut has now been completely, uh, you know, conquered by the Russians, it appears. We've also heard recently about uh, uh, these kamikaze drones striking close to Moscow, which the media is saying has rattled the folks, the Moscovites in that city. The war is coming closer to home for them. Uh, how do you see where things stand now with kind of those th two things as the backdrop and anything else that you'd like to? Well, as a, as a general observation, and this is, I think, very important for Americans to understand, I think we've reached a point in this conflict and crisis that is probably more dangerous than it has ever been, certainly uh, since 22 February and perhaps the most dangerous point uh, since the Cuban Missile Crisis. We, we have <clears throat> an unwillingness in Washington and its closest allies in Western Europe to really talk to the Russians, to find a way to end this tragedy in Ukraine, to stop the complete destruction of the Ukrainian state and uh, the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. There's just no willingness to do it. And the Russians are now confronting the reality that since we are unwilling to negotiate, that not only will they have to continue to press this war to the finish, but they may actually have to mobilize the nation to go to war. And I think these these things are, are points that Americans are not hearing about. Now, you mentioned two things. One was Bakhmut. Well, Bakhmut was essentially a, a trap that the Russians set for the Ukrainians. It was always Zelensky who kept insisting that Bakhmut was not just another town on the map. It was a symbol of Ukrainian resistance. It was also a hub for transportation and logistics. Therefore, the Ukrainians had to fight and win it. When the Russians discovered that, and I would say they, they became pretty convinced that uh, this was an obsession with the Ukrainians, in December of last year, they decided to go ahead and let as many Ukrainians as possible march into the trap. So in the meantime, they've killed at least 50,000 Ukrainians involved with Bakhmut and probably wounded uh, at least that many or more just as a result of the Bakhmut operation. And I think when it became clear that the Ukrainians were no longer going to reinforce failure, the Russians decided to close it off, which is what they've done. They finally moved in, eradicated the last bit of resistance, and have now prepared this front of several hundred miles in southern Ukraine for Ukraine's widely announced and heralded counterattack. Now, as far as the drone strikes on the Kremlin are concerned, we're not sure how many were originally launched Somebody said 19, perhaps 20, 25, doesn't make any difference. It looks as though <clears throat> three of them got through <clears throat> the integrated air defenses at least close enough <clears throat> to fall to the ground within, let us say, a kilometer or two of Putin's private residence. And it seems pretty clear that they were trying to target his residence. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that's <clears throat> it's pretty clear evidence that we provided them with the data and the trajectory. I think the uh, drones themselves were probably launched from inside Russia. And people people frequently say, well, what's wrong with the Russians? Why can't they control their border? Well, the Russians have an 1,100-mile border. That's uh, pretty substantial. And it doesn't lend itself to walls and barbed wire because you have dense forests, massive rivers, so they can only protect so much. So inevitably, something's going to get through. But ultimately, the whole business failed. And I think that's why they subsequently, that is, the Russians launched a strike against the secret police headquarters in Kiev. And uh, that apparently was very devastating. And reportedly, uh, there were large numbers of NATO officers also present in the headquarters when it was struck. I haven't seen any real confirmation that that is true. That's being alleged. <clears throat> 
by everybody on the ground over there. But again, we haven't seen any evidence in terms of bodies being removed and transported back to the United States, Great Britain, or, or other countries. <clears throat> so I think what the Russians have done now is they said, look, we know where everything is. And they do. They have the same overhead surveillance capability that we do. So that you can't hide from uh, Russian military power in Ukraine. And uh, the Russians have exercised to this point really remarkable restraint. They have not attacked cities, destroyed cities. They've only attacked weapon systems, particularly air defenses or weapon supply points, uh, assembly areas, which in many cases were near or in cities, but they have not attacked cities. In other words, they have not done what we did during World War II, which is wholesale destroy uh, Ukrainian cities. We destroyed Japanese and German cities. And Putin is held back deliberately because he wants to negotiate an end to this. And we keep insisting that there will be negoti no negotiation, that he has to be driven out. Well, the possibility that the Ukrainians are going to drive the Russians out of, out of Ukraine is about zero. So the real question is, what do the Russians do next? And I think they'll wait for this counteroffensive by the Ukrainians, and then I think they'll strike. And I think we'll see their forces move. And uh, they will complete the, uh, the destruction of Ukrainian forces, and certainly in eastern Ukraine. They will take Kharkov again and Odessa, which are historically Russian cities. And I imagine they'll probably close up on the Dnieper River just as a matter of security. Now, what happens after that? Again, I, I think that uh, Moscow would prefer to negotiate an end to this business. Whether or not we'll show up and do anything is unknown to me. It says, uh, according to CNBC, just a few minutes ago, as we're recording, that drone strikes have continued to attack uh, the uh, Russian soil, including two oil refineries roughly 50 miles from Russia's highly important Black Sea oil export terminals. And um, <clears throat> so uh, is that the counteroffensive that we're talking about here, or is there something else? What, what no, I think <clears throat> I think you're going to see some serious effort on the ground. The Ukrainians have brought about thirty to 35,000 soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, back from training areas in the United States, Germany, the Czech Republic, Canada, they are going to be assembled and become the backbone of a new counterattack force. Now, how large will it be beyond that? I don't know. Uh, but these are these are well-trained troops, and they're going to try and penetrate the Russian defenses in the south. I suspect that they will try at several points, but they will make an effort at one point uh, because they just don't have that much striking power anymore on the ground. They can't afford to dissipate uh, their forces. That is the Ukrainians. And I, I think it'll fail, but uh, I think they feel obligated to uh, try or, or face the possibility that more European states will desert them uh, and no longer supply them. And after all, the Europeans have largely run out of equipment to send and ammunition to send. We're pretty close to that as well. So uh, do you think they're going to continue to go into Belgorod, that area they've been talking about? They've been I don't think they can go into it with any significant force. Uh, everything that went in there was largely destroyed. All the, all the troops were killed. I don't know how many times they can do that and lose everybody they send. That's been the biggest problem for the Ukrainians. I mean, this obsession with launching offensive operations has bled them dry. We're, we're not sure how many hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian troops have, have been killed. We know that comparatively few Russians have been killed or wounded. I think the exchange rate has been on the whole about one to eight. Uh, one uh, Russian for every eight Ukrainians. And I think that's pretty standard. The issue is if you're in Moscow right now and you're looking at the strategic picture in the West, it's becoming increasingly clear that you're going to have to launch an offensive in order to bring this to some sort of conclusion. Then hope that uh, the Europeans will want to negotiate separately. And I think that the probability of that happening is growing with each passing day. Germany has now slipped into a very severe recession that could easily turn into a depression. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Germans have lost their jobs in very important industries, chemical industries, 
anything that is petroleum based, obviously, heavy industry. Uh, Germany is really the the engine of prosperity for the European Union. And as Germany sinks deeper and deeper into recession, more and more people lose their jobs, the impact on the rest of Europe is going to be profound. And once it becomes clear that the standard of living is falling dramatically, things are unaffordable or you can't get them, particularly food, then I think the people in charge are in a lot of trouble. So that's that's in the future. Uh, I can't predict when that will happen, but that's definitely going to happen. And the question is, uh, how long do the Russians wait? And I don't think they're going to wait very long. I think they're going to use the summer to try and wrap this up as much as they possibly can. I thought, maybe I've got this wrong, but I thought that they don't do stuff too much when the ground is when it's warm because the mud is so thick you're not really tainted. no that's true but the ground is now solidifying in ukraine it's now hard enough to support the movement of large numbers of armored vehicles that's for both sides ukrainians and russians remember the mud is is agnostic it cuts both ways it it's, stops ukrainians and stops russians that's why you've been watching these world war one style infantry battles because you just could not move large maneuver forces. That's about to change. And I think the Ukrainians will open the summer with some sort of offensive. I don't think it'll work. I think they'll take terrible losses, and I think the Russians will then counterattack. So is Russia going to have to go all the way to Kiev to get them to submit? Is that, I mean, in their calculation? Well, I think that uh, the probability of that being the case is, is growing with each passing day. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the Russians don't want to rule Ukrainians. I mean, Putin has said this several times. He's not interested in, quote unquote, conquering Ukraine, never was. All he wanted was neutrality for Ukraine. And what we did is we rejected neutrality in favor of the so-called NATO membership. But we had already spent eight years from uh, 2014 until 2022 building up this huge Ukrainian army equipping it, training it, staffing it with the best officers and non-commissioned officers that we could find, and then preparing to launch it against the Russians. I, I think if the Russians had not attacked it, probably by the summer of 2022, uh, you would probably have seen uh, limited Ukrainian offensives against uh, Russians in eastern Ukraine. Remember, that all of this is about the fact that the Russian people in eastern Ukraine, and that's almost a third of the Ukrainian population that speak Russian, are culturally Russian, ethnically Russian, they were oppressed. They were treated as third-class citizens inside Ukraine. They were forced to either, quote-unquote, Ukrainianize or leave the country. So the, the Minsk agreements were designed to address this, but as we found out from Merkel and Macron in Europe, uh, those agreements were a fraud. They were never serious. They were simply designed to buy time for the expansion and growth of Ukrainian military power. So now most of that military power is being destroyed. You have very few people with any experience uh, that have survived combat and are capable left. That's why the return of these 30 to 35,000 from overseas is so important. So this is sort of the last gasp that I think the Ukrainians can manage on the ground. The Russians will dispatch it. And again, I think the Russians have figured out we're going to have to go to the river to the Dnieper. We're going to have to turn south, take Odessa, turn north, take Kharkov. Those are the things that they were interested in to begin with, because that's where the Russians live. They don't really want to cross the river and try to manage or rule western Ukraine. I mean, the Russians aren't stupid. They know that the Ukrainians don't want to be ruled from Moscow. But they feel compelled at this point to continue further, simply because we've made it clear that whatever remains of Ukraine, we will transform into some sort of battering ram to be used against Russia. Russia is not going to accept that. The analogy would be if we discovered that the, the Chinese or the Russians or someone else was trying to transform Mexico into a platform for attack against the United States. Now, some people would say that's already happened with the drug cartels. That's another subject, and I agree that something we, we should be much more concerned about that than what's happening in Ukraine. But the point is, we would not tolerate foreign forces on the ground in Mexico building up an anti-American force. We would destroy it. Well, that's essentially what the Russians have done in Ukraine. But we don't want to rule Mexicans either. We want the Mexicans to govern themselves.
And the Russians want the Ukrainians to govern themselves, but they want neutrality for whatever remains of Ukraine. And that that condition is not going to change. So how how spent is Russia in terms of how many soldiers do they have? How many have they lost? How many are in the the, the best quality uh, to 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 continue this type of uh, war? Their their economic and, and weapons situation. Where are they at? How spent are they in this whole? Well, their economy is booming. Uh, they're doing uh, land office business. Uh, their exports, particularly of minerals and petroleum products, is at an all time high. Uh, there is a meeting that will occur later this month in St. Petersburg involving 84 countries. And all of these countries are interested in what Russia and China are billing as gold-backed currency. All of these countries want to get out from under the U.S.-dominated financial system in the West. And the only way to do that is to go to, first and foremost, gold-backed currency trading. Uh, the Russians... The Chinese, the Indians, uh, obviously the Saudis and many of the Emirates have stockpiled an enormous quantity of gold. So they're ready to move in this direction. This would cut us out of the loop and essentially remove the burden of dealing with us through our system. This also means that they stop trading in dollars, which means we can't pass on our debt to them anymore, which is effectively what happens when they do business with us in dollars. Those 84 countries, plus uh, Russia, India, China, uh, I think they have a very good chance of bringing this off. Uh, so that's the first thing. The point is that economically, we have not hurt Russia at all. Russia has boomed. Secondly, militarily, their factories are operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week to produce military equipment of all types and kinds, everything from cruise missiles, tactical ballistic missiles, all the way to tanks and and uh, aircraft and and rifles, so they, there is no shortage of equipment. Lastly, manpower. Well, they right now have about eight hundred plus thousand in the uh, Russian army, and that number continues to grow. There are certainly seven hundred thousand either involved in the Ukrainian operation or serving in Russia in support of it. There are probably three to 400,000 Russian combat troops between Belorussia, up north, White Russia, and southern Ukraine ready to strike as needed. <clears throat> so they're in a very good position. But as I said at the beginning of this discussion, one of the things that is now being discussed behind the scenes in Moscow is the potential for total mobilization. If they go to a full mobilization force, then you're talking about 2 million men in the uh, Russian army. All coming into Ukraine, or not all coming in, right? Well, you, you know, this this all depends on us. I mean, they they're, they don't want to do these things. But if we are going to stand fast at, on our insistence that whatever remains of Ukraine has to be part of NATO, has to be hostile to Russia, has to host foreign forces, has to potentially host missile systems that we would put on the ground that threatened Russia, which was always on the agenda, as long as we insist upon that, the chances of the Russians going to full-blown mobilization are quite real. And uh, that means that they'll move all the way to the Polish border, as well as to the Romanian border and the Moldovan border, once and for all. They just don't want a repetition of what they've just been through in Ukraine again. I mean, that's understandable. They don't want to go through this. But we, again, have refused to consider any alternative to what I just described. And it's it's unfortunate, David, because, you know, neutrality could have been an enormous bonanza for Ukraine. Neutrality is what Austria has enjoyed for decades. Austria's standard of living before it, it became neutral was far below Germany. Today, the standard of living in Austria is actually above Germany. In other words, Austria has profited economically enormously from neutrality. And I think Ukraine could have done that as well and been a bridge of prosperity between East and West. So who's calling the shots over there to keep it going? Zelensky, its government, his his patrons, or United States, CIA? Is there different factions fighting over how to deal with this? or is it All, all of the above. All of the above. Uh, Zelensky has always been sponsored by 
by key figures uh, in Washington, London, New York City. Was it always a lie, basically, when he came into power on a position of trying to normalize race relations with Russia? Was it always? I, I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. And uh, the thing that people should remember. Reminds me of George W. Bush running as a humble yeah. policy and turning into a warmonger. No, that's right. Yeah, I remember that Bush uh, sitting across from McCain during the primary season. Everybody agreed that our intervention in Kosovo and Bosnia had been a mistake. Uh-huh. How many it's R's the same are there tactic, that chance, you go. Right? It's always the guy that runs as the as the anti-war guy that turns into the big belligerent John Bolton fan. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Zelensky was always uh, always not who he appeared to be. Remember, Zelensky, strictly speaking, never spoke any Ukrainian. He only spoke Russian. That was his first language. And now, how uh, did their government have the audacity if he only spoke Russian, but yet they were criminalizing people for saying good morning? And Russian in the eastern side. How did they do that? I don't. How, how did they square that one? Well, this is this is part of the reason he had so much support, though, because most people in oh. Ukraine simply did not want Ukraine to be hostile to Russia. They didn't want a war, right. and he essentially said, "If you elect me, I'll I'll find a way forward. I'll negotiate peace with Putin." Now it took him about three months to to get to the point where he was fluent in Ukrainian and spoke it you know, largely accent-free, although I'm told by many Russian and Ukrainian speakers that he continues to speak Ukrainian with a Russian accent. I, I don't know. Uh, the bottom line is, it, at this point, it's it's academic. Is he really interested in Ukraine? Uh, I, I find it hard to believe. I mean, he's sitting there with Larry Fink from BlackRock, and BlackRock is keenly interested in stripping all the resources it can from Ukraine and Russia buying up all the property in Ukraine uh, ostensibly for future use by him and his uh, co-investors. And this is something that Zelensky is willing to do. Doesn't sound like a Ukrainian nationalist to me. So I I think... Uh, but aren't, I think the the Ukrainian nationalists their, aren't there Ukrainian nationalists their best fighters? What would be their morale in continually fighting for BlackRock at this point? I don't understand. If there's, you know, yeah. I'm just trying to think strategically... If they're all into this, and they're saying, wait a second, we're doing this for BlackRock? I, I thought we were all nationalistic or something. Well, remember, David, that one of the advantages that the people spitting out the narrative of evil Russians who are committing atrocities and all this sort of business had the advantage of the Cold War behind us. I mean, for decades, people saw anybody who spoke Russian as potentially dangerous and uh, certainly, if not evil, then certainly criminal in some way. Well, the Cold War ended, but this sort of uh, picture of Russia lingered into the present. Mm -hmm. Now, today's Russia is not perfect. No society is, but it is certainly nothing at all like the Soviet Union. It is a Russian Orthodox Christian country. It is nationally based around Russian national identity, culture, and language. I think those are some of the reasons why the, the Western, what I call the oligarchs in the West, are so interested in destroying it. But the real underlying purpose is if they can bring down uh, Russia, its government, if they can replace, say, Putin with someone like Zelensky, then ultimately you can gain access to all the resources that Russia has to offer. And Russia's resources are in abundance, and they would love to have access to that. So I think that's a legitimate concern for the Russians, and I think we we need to understand that that's behind their thinking. Now, if you're a Ukrainian, you're also a victim of your experience with the Soviet Union. Remember that you had somewhere between six and nine million Ukrainians that were systematically starved, uh, murdered, or transported to their deaths in the gulag between 1929 and 1932 under Stalin. And the memory of the NKVD officers who came in there and did those things to the population has deep roots. So you're evoking these memories by appealing to Ukrainians to fight against the Russians, even though today's Russians bear no resemblance to the force that was communist and Soviet back in the 1930s. We even see these old descriptions lifted from histories of the Soviet armed forces during World War II that talk about the nature of the Soviet soldier, and they just strip out all the old language and they put in Russian soldier in the modern era, attributing the same attributes and the same behavior patterns to them 
that were there in 1933 to say 1945. It's not true, but again, how do you how do you fight this underlying predisposition for people to believe the worst about a about your chosen enemy? It's very difficult to fight that. And I think 